We want the exciting things that we see in sci-fi, in like sci-fi movies and books, we want that to come true one day. Three, minus three, two, one, zero, ignition. In fact, I think hardly anyone in the public knows that this is happening. Like, how do we you know, get this message across? Hey, really cool stuff's happening, you know? Tune in. SpaceX is like no other rocket company. They're in an unglamorous building, in the middle of nowhere, in kind of a industrial zone. But when you walk into the doors and all of a sudden you see they're making these pristine, gorgeous rockets. It feels like you've walked into a factory on another planet. No one has ever really contemplated this in a serious way. In the beginning, we thought, this is so crazy. What are we doing trying to come up with something like this? And then over time, we're like, yeah, I know, it can definitely be done. And now we're just kind of arguing over the details. I went to uh, Russia to look at buying um, a, a refurbished ICBM, which is a very trippy experience. Uh, it was very bizarre. Um, and when I tell people that, they're like, what? <laughs> I went to Russia three times to, to look at buying um, a refurbished ICBM. Uh, because that, that was the best deal. Um, and uh, I can tell you it was very weird going there in, in 2000, late 2001, 2002, going to the, the Russian rocket forces and saying, I'd like to buy two of your biggest rockets, uh, but you can keep the nuke. <laughs> Musk made three trips to Russia trying to buy an intercontinental ballistic missile called the Dnieper. Turns out the Dnieper was so expensive his idea never flew. So Musk decided that the only way to get an affordable rocket was to build it himself. And he started SpaceX. The odds of me coming into the rocket business, not knowing anything about rockets, not having ever built anything, I mean, um, I would have to be insane if I thought the odds were in my favor. How did you get the expertise to be the chief technology officer of a rocket ship company? Um, well, uh, I do have a physics background. That's helpful as a foundation. Um, and then I read a lot of books and talked to a lot of, a lot of smart people. You're self-taught? Yeah. Well, well self-taught, yes, meaning um, I, didn't, I don't have an aerospace degree. So how, how did you go about acquiring the knowledge? Well, uh, I, like I said, I read a lot of books, talked to a lot of people, and, and have a great team. Uh, raw metal comes in, and then we build the engines, uh, the airframe, the electronics, and we integrate all of that together. Uh, and, and that's all done more or less under one roof. Metal comes in one end of this factory. Yeah. Spaceships come out the other. Yes. You know, there are American heroes who don't like this idea. Neil uh, Armstrong, yeah. Gene Cernan have both testified against commercial space flight in the way that you're developing it, and I wonder what you think of that. Now is the time to overrule this administration's pledge to mediocrity. I was very sad to see that, uh, because those guys are, yeah. You know, th those guys are heroes of mine, so it's really tough. They inspired you to do this, didn't they? Yes and to see them casting stones in your direction. It's difficult. But you know, like, creating a company is almost like having a child. So it's sort of like, how do you say your child should not have food? So one, once you have the company, you have to feed it and nurse it yeah. and <laughs> take care of it, of it even if it, it ruins you? Yeah. In 2008, 
the rocket company is not going well. You've no. had three failures. Great. The car company is hemorrhaging money. Yeah. And the American economy has tanked in the worst recession since the Great Depression. Right. What was that year like for you? And I'm getting divorced, by the way, <laughs> to add, add to that. Uh, that, was, that was definitely at the worst year of my life. But at the age of 37, he hit rock bottom. His first rockets failed to reach orbit. End of 2008. How did you get through that period of crisis? Yeah. Can we just break for a second? Sure, sure, yeah, of course. Yeah. I remember waking up the Sunday uh, before Christmas uh, on, in 2008 and thinking to myself, man, I never thought I was someone who could ever uh, be capable of a nervous breakdown. Um, and, but I, I felt this was the closest I've ever come because um, it, it seemed pretty, pretty dark. We were running on fumes at that point. We had virtually no money. So a fourth failure... A fourth failure would have been absolutely game over. Done. Done. SpaceX bankrupt. Yes, yeah, it's bad enough to have three strikes. Having four strikes, it's really it's kaput. <laughs> Flight four was flawless. In Musk's world, it lit the darkness. Stage separation. Your separation confirmed. NASA called and told us that we'd won a one and a half billion dollar contract. And I couldn't even hold the phone. It's like, I just, I just blurted out, I love you guys. <laughs> they saved you. Yeah, they did. Only four entities have launched a space capsule into orbit and successfully brought it back. The United States, Russia, China, and Elon Musk. But, but when uh, critics say you can't do this, your answer to them is, we've done it. But the big prize is winning the NASA contract to build America's next manned spacecraft. And Elon Musk is facing stiff competition. SpaceX is also testing a rocket that can be reused, softly landing on a column of flame. Another step on a longer journey. Just a very tough uh, engineering problem. In the last 12 months or so, I've come to the conclusion that, that it can be solved. Um, and, and I think SpaceX is going to try to do it. Falcon 9 is essentially standing on the shoulders of titans, as they like to say in literature. We've built upon a lot of those lessons, the things that NASA has learned. We've taken that, but used kind of a clean sheet of paper that says, how can you build a rocket knowing that we want to do things that have not been done before? After years of designing and testing the Falcon 9, in 2015, SpaceX set out to make history by attempting the first ever landing of a first stage orbital rocket. I've heard it described as you standing on the top of the Empire State Building and you drop a pencil off and you have to land the pencil on its eraser on a postage stamp. Okay, this is bad. This is bad. It's standing up. It's standing up. Oh, look at this. Look at, this. look at this. Look at it. It's just sitting there. Look at that. What? Holy smokes, man. Wow, this thing actually landed intact and amazing. That was crazy. Heavy lift capability is the critical technology needed to enable human missions to Mars, and a reusable heavy lift vehicle is the critical technology needed to settle Mars. In the need for an urgent abort, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the primary countdown net. I'm back secure for T0, 88.3 degrees. Reminder, side booster engine startup is at T minus seven seconds. SpaceX, Falcon Heavy, go for launch. Three, two, two one.
Pico. Successful separation. Yes, light. Before SpaceX can launch crew, two major milestones must be completed without crew. The first is the Demonstration 1 mission, or Demo-1, in which SpaceX must autonomously fly their Crew Dragon capsule to the International Space Station and back. The second test is called the Launch Escape Test, also known as the In-Flight Abort Test. If the rocket fails, the Dragon capsule's emergency abort system is triggered, ejecting the capsule safely away from the rocket. Then there is the third and final test, called the Demonstration 2 mission, or Demo-2, which will launch NASA astronauts Bob and Doug to the space station. Demonstration 1 mission, or the Demo-1 mission, is an uncrewed flight. We're sending the Dragon autonomously to space station to dock and come home. Today's launch marks the beginning of the Crew Dragon Demo-1 mission. This is one of SpaceX's most challenging milestones yet, a five-day uncrewed journey to the International Space Station and back. Three, two, one, zero. Ignition, lift off. You know, you're basically putting enough energy into the spacecraft such that it's equivalent to like a meteor. It's just like it's difficult for people to even comprehend. Power and telemetry normal. The first one is going to be the main engine cutoff, or MECO. That's when the nine Merlin 1D engines that you can see on your screen right now uh, will cut off uh, shortly before a stage separation. For the first stage, it starts its engines back up. It flips itself around, and the whole first stage is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and slowly making its way back down for a landing on a drone ship that is out in the Atlantic Ocean. Landing legs have deployed. And Falcon 9 has landed. After the first stage separation is complete, the Crew Dragon capsule is propelled into orbit by the second stage. The second stage is lighting up its engine, and it's taking the Dragon spacecraft into orbit. Once the second stage successfully gets Dragon into the orbit that it is intended to go, it separates Dragon and moves away. This is a pivotal moment. The separation of the second stage from the Dragon capsule is the final step of the launch sequence. Dragon, separation confirmed. It's amazing. This is a game changer. The launch vehicle places it in orbit. That's low Earth orbit. It's actually fairly below and uh, behind the International Space Station. 